So pretty much since the day he was elected, there has been a faction of the Democratic Party who have either secretly or overtly called for the impeachment of Donald Trump. One man in particular is putting his considerable wealth where his mouth is. Donald Trump can't be trusted to govern within the law, and his lies are hurting the country. Congress should begin impeachment hearings now so they can gather and preserve evidence to make sure the American people finally get the truth. Tom Steyer has spent $40 million of his own money in an effort to finance President Trump's impeachment. Monday night, he attended a town hall about that very subject in Baltimore, Maryland. That happens to be House Oversight Committee Chairman Elijah Cummings' district. Pretty sure that's no coincidence there. Here to talk about that town hall and also his plans moving forward is Tom Steyer. Great to have you, sir. Crystal, thank you so much for having me. Uh, how was the town hall last night? Did you learn anything, hear anything interesting? I mean, town halls, and we've done over 40 of them around the United States, are always fantastic, fun, and great chances to learn from people around the country. And, and am I right? No coincidence that it's there in Elijah Cummings' district? Oh, absolutely no coincidence. I mean, yeah. we've tried to show that the people in the districts of congressional leaders are very strongly in favor of impeaching and removing this president. And in fact, part of the town hall last night was to th say thank you to Congressman Cummings for, in fact, being the first person to call public hearings. Michael Cohen will be testifying in front of his committee in public tomorrow so that we can, in fact, do what has to happen, which is get the information directly to the American people about this president's lawlessness. So I want to get to Michael Cohen in a second. But first, make the case for why impeachment now? We're already into the 2020 <clears throat> election cycle. You know, why not do this at the ballot box through the electoral process rather than going through an impeachment process? So the implication of waiting for November 2020 for the election is a couple of things. One is that there's no cost to keeping this president in office, that in fact he will be a normal person pursuing the presidency in a normal way, which is not true. If you just look at yesterday's headlines in the Washington Post. This president had, was trying to put together a secret committee of fake scientists mm -hmm. to come up in a secret way with no oversight, with fake science, to try and debunk the idea that the climate is changing. Mm -hmm. That is not normal. He is basically going around all the rules and norms of American government and American values to do the opposite of his job, which is to protect the American people. So the first thing is the assumption, if we wait two years, is there's no cost to having this lawless and dangerous president. The second thing that's true about it is this. We claim to be a country of laws. Mm -hmm. We claim to be a country that respects the law and treats people, people equally before the law. If the president is above the law, if he has clearly merited being thrown out of office and we do nothing, that is a statement about who we are. That says that we apply the law when it's convenient to us, and we apply the law unequally, mm -hmm. and we especially don't take care of people who are powerful or important or rich. And that is a terrible statement to make in the United States, that we actually only apply the law when it's convenient for us. So I agree with basically all of that. However, I think the flip side is the idea that there's no cost to impeachment when, unfortunately, you have a sizable minority in the country who think that this president has been framed from day one, that the deep state's been trying to take him out, and they will view any impeachment process as illegitimate. Does that hurt our democracy? Well, let me, Crystal, let me try and rephrase what you just said. Mm -hmm. We believe, and I strongly believe, that I'm only doing two things. I'm telling the truth, and I'm trying to stand up this movement that we're trying to organize. It's really not me. It's the seven and a half million people who've signed Need to Impeach are trying to tell the truth and stand up for the Constitution and the safety of the American people. So what you're asking me, in effect, is if a group of people don't want to tell the truth, and don't want to stand up for the safety of the American people in the Constitution, that we shouldn't do it, that they, in effect, have a veto on the truth and have a veto on doing the right thing. And we can't let that happen. Because in American history, when we've made great steps forward, if you think about the civil rights movement, there are a group of people who violently opposed the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And I do mean violently. Yes. But in fact, the people in that movement 
persisted and moved forward because it was important and they were telling the truth and it was actually a gigantic service to the whole United States. And that's the point. You can't let people dissuade you from doing what's right mm -hmm. because they want to do something else. So tell me about your plans. How do you how do you plan to move forward? Well, we know you've spent money in Nadler and Neal and Cummings districts, pushing them on impeachment. You ran ads in 2018 as well. What's next in terms of who's going to be targeted? Well, yeah, our basic goal is a grassroots goal, mm -hmm. which is to push the power back to the American people. That's why we're doing a petition, a, an impeachment petition, asking people to sign up so that it's their voice that counts. So what, we're, what we want to have happen is public open hearings on TV where the American people across the country and across party lines and every other division of Americans get to see this gang of thugs that have been working with Mr. Trump and get to hear from their mouths, as we're going to hear tomorrow in front of Congressman Cummings' committee, the crimes they committed, their relationship to Mr. Trump, so that the American people can see for themselves what's already on the public record, right. which is that this president has committed crimes, corruption, and cover-ups. What do you expect to hear from Michael Cohen, um, and do you think that it will do you think it will change any minds? Because that's been one of the things that we've seen. The president's approval rating stays pretty steady. His people seem to stay with him no matter what comes out. And people who are opposed to him stay opposed to him. Do you think that the Cohen testimony could shift that dynamic? I don't think there's any question that it can shift the dynamic. And I, I think the question will be, does it make it clear, which I believe it will, hmm. that Mr. Trump has committed crimes while in office? And I think if you... It, that if that's true and it's documentable and obvious, that that is a smoking gun that says he really does not belong in office. Have you, had, have you had Democratic leaders come to you and say, can you lay off this impeachment stuff? This is not what we want to talk about. Well, you know, the funny thing is, Crystal, you may not know this, I actually do know how to read. <laughs> <laughs> I guessed, but I didn't have a confirmation on that. <laughs> I want to confirm. Since about fourth grade, I've been a pretty good reader. And... <laughs> What we, I mean, obviously people have been pushing back and saying, you know, this may not be politically practical. Right. You know, there may be cost to this. But let me say this. We're talking about what's right. We're talking about protecting the American people from a really dangerous president. And we're telling the truth. Everybody knows we're telling the truth. Yeah. The Republicans know we're telling the truth. They know he's unfit for office. And they know he's committed a series of crimes. The Democrats know it, too. What everyone talks to us about, when we're inside the Beltway, as we are right now, indeed, they talk to us about the horse race. Mm -hmm. They don't say, you're not telling the truth. They don't say, he's fit for office or he's a good president. They say, can this actually happen in the real world? Yeah. And what we've seen, first of all, we're putting our trust and trying to engage and empower the American people. And the American people can have their way, period. If we decide as a people we want this, it will happen period. And that's our goal. But, you know, it, people want to see how, how can you show me the steps? And, you know, this is going to be a fluid situation. And we know that. But if you can't show people the steps, does that mean you shouldn't start the civil rights movement? Mm -hmm. Does that mean you shouldn't pour the tea into Boston Harbor? Mm -hmm. Does that mean you should never stand up for what's right unless you know you're going to win in the end? What we know is that what we're doing is what's right. We should be doing it, and we're trying to engage the American people to demand as a group what's right. So let me ask you about your passion, <clears throat> environmentalism, and saving the planet. Um, Casia cortez is kind of an important passion that you have there. Um, Casia cortez has really pushed forward this idea of a Green New Deal resolution introduced, uh, along with uh, Ed Markey in the Senate. Um, are you a Green New Deal supporter, fan? Are there drawbacks to it that you're concerned about? Look, I'm an absolute fan. Let's start with that. I think she's done us a signal service by coming up with a plan that is large enough to fit the problem that it's meant to solve. And I think that she's gotten great attention to it. She's made that clear, and I think she's done a fantastic service. Mm -hmm. I think she and Ed Markey would agree it's a first draft. You know, they're putting something forward, and of course there are going to be many iterations. But I think she's done something really important, which is to reframe how big that problem is and to make the point 
that incremental thinking is not going to solve that right. problem. That in fact, you know, I think there's a tendency in politics to say, you say zero, I say 100, so it must be 50. Right. Well, when you're talking about physics, you can say zero and I can say 100, but Mother Nature says whatever the truth is, and she's not going to compromise with us. Right. And I think that's what Representative Ocasio-Cortez did such a good job, is to say, this is the, the size of the problem. It needs a solution that's commensurate with that, and I give her a ton of credit for doing it. Have you spoken with her or with Marky or any of their people to advise them, give feedback, ideas? Yeah. You know, I, I did talk to her, and I think, look, in all of this, if you look at how big that problem is, it's going to take a gigantic solution. But I think the other thing that's really true about it is... Were there any is, critiques or any specific parts you said? Look, in we all part, look, look we, I've been thinking about this for over you, a decade. Right, We've been working right. on this. We've done studies, you know, all of the questions about how to do it, the technology, the science, the politics, how to tailor it so that it's particularly helpful for pe the people who've been harmed by pollution in our society. There's a ton of details that would go into the final draft as opposed to the first draft. That's true. But this is a fantastic step forward. It really is. And I think that one of the things that it does is it points out that in s solving this problem, we actually will not just address the issue of climate change, but we can make ourselves richer. We can create millions of net good paying jobs. So we'll make people better employed and you know, better paid, and we'll make Americans healthier. Mm -hmm. And also, let's not forget, we go back to leading the world instead of trailing the world. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be the only country on the planet Earth that's denying science, that's trying to hold back the tide and, t you know, basically lie to make money. That is not a leadership position that the United States should aspire to. Is Green New Deal in your mind a litmus test for any 2020 candidate you would back? There is, I would never back a candidate who, in 2020 who did not speak dramatically, powerfully about the need to address climate change. It would be an absolute deal breaker. I wanted to ask you about, um, Senator, well, first let me ask you, why did you decide not to run? Everybody else decided to run. You're like the one guy who said, you know what, I'm good. <laughs> so congratulations on that. Um, what made you decide, you know, to, to keep persisting with what you're doing? Look, I thought that... It wasn't that I decided not to run, it's that I decided to do this. Yeah. Look, I think the crisis in America is Donald Trump. I think the emergency in America is Donald Trump. And I think that if we can address this as a people, in fact, if we can bridge the partisan divide to decide that we shouldn't have a lawless president who puts himself above the country and above the law, mm -hmm. that that is a gigantic step forward towards addressing all of our other problems. Yeah. Because let's face it, we need a positive vision again of what we're trying to accomplish in this country. And in order to do that, we have to come together. Yeah. In order to come together, here's a very simple thing. Do we believe in the law? Do we believe that someone who breaks the law and puts himself above the American people and doesn't protect us should be thrown out of office? Because we're gonna replace him with a Republican. So if we can do that, then we're a people who do the right thing under the mm. gun, we accomplish things, and we can then do more of it. That's interesting. Now, I, I'm sure you have spoken with a number of the 2020 contenders, and I assume you're on the fence still as to whether whether you're even going to get behind one particular individual. But I wanted to get your thoughts on Elizabeth Warren just came out in a letter to her supporters and said, I'm not doing call time to donors. I'm not giving special access to donors. I'm not doing fundraising events for donors. She's really sort of drawing a line in the sand about money in politics. Now, you're obviously someone who has given generously in the political system and, and tried to do the right thing and stand up for your values. Um, do you think that that's a smart move? Do you think it's the right thing that Elizabeth Warren is doing there? Look, I think there's no question that money has corrupted politics. And I think there's no question that corporate money in particular has corrupted politics. Mm. We've tried really hard in the way that we are organized, and I personally am organized, to accept the system the way it is and then to be really positive about it. So, you know, we try, I try and be transparent about everything I do. Here I am talking to you about what we're doing and why. I try and make sure that nothing I do could ever help me financially, so I don't own any clean energy stocks personally because I would never want people to think that I'm advocating for the 
right. Green New Deal so that I could make money. Line your pockets, yeah. And we are a grassroots organization, so everything we do, like the need to impeach petition, is designed to push power down to the people, government of, by, and for the people. Having said that, we definitely need campaign finance reform. We definitely need to get rid of that Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, that allows corporations to participate fulsomely mm -hmm. in the political campaign, campaigns. And I believe that what Senator Warren is doing, which is in effect to do campaign finance reform for herself, right. is something which can work and speaks to a need to reform the system itself, which I think is absolutely true. There's a, a deep concern on, in the Democratic Party about inequality and about you know, the gains going to the top and, and most people really struggling. There's a lot of skepticism, frankly, of folks like you have done very well. Um, do you share that concern? And how do you feel about some of the specific proposals that have been put out? Look, I think there's no question that American inequality has exploded in the last 40 years, however you measure it. And I think that it's a threat to justice in our country. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a threat to our democracy itself. I mean, to me, the biggest political fact in America is that almost eight out of 10 Americans, including me, think the democracy has been purchased by corporations. Mm -hmm. And that actually it is their will that gets followed through the political process. And I think that that is a critical thing. When I think about inequality, and we've thought about it really hard, first of all, I. I mean, I think that we have to push the living wage. People deserve a living wage. They mm -hmm. deserve a light to, a, a, the right to be paid enough to live decently in our society if they're working full time. And I think that would involve a ton of policies that would support that. But let me give you an analogy, because there's an inherent question here about do you believe in the private sector at all? Do you believe in success in the private sector, or does success in the private sector mean somehow that it's illegitimate? And I think about government and the private sector as having different functions in our society. Mm -hmm. So I think about the government. I'm going to put it in the, in the context of a car. Government in our society, elected representative democracy, is like driving a car. We decide as a people, with every person having an equal vote, where to go. Mm -hmm where to turn the car, where to steer the, the, the car. The private sector is like the engine. It's the power that lets us get there, but it shouldn't decide where to go. Mm. The problem that we've had is the engine, the private sector, is now allowed to spend unlimited money to direct where we go, and they're trying to get it to go places that benefit them, not the bulk of Americans. And that's why we've seen this explosion of inequality in the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. It's not just a, it's not a coincidence. There have been a series of decisions and laws and attitudes, starting really with President Reagan, yeah. where it was like the private sector is good, the private sector is just, mm -hmm. the private sector is efficient. The problem we have is too much government. Yeah. But if you take my analogy, my comparison, think about it in terms of a car. You don't want the engine advocating for where the car should go. The engine just serves the person driving it, which is the American people, and what they think is valuable. And I think that we've gotten this huge confusion. And so when I think about inequality, I think we have gotten very unjust. It's been over a long period of time, a series of decisions across the country, including all these anti-union sentiment and attempt to really hamstring working people across mm -hmm. the board. Mm -hmm. And I think it's completely unfair, and I think it has to do with the corruption of the political system, and I think it's a, a national scandal. Well, I've kept you for a long time, but I do have one more question for you, if you don't mind. I really appreciate all that you've given <laughs> is us. Is this a zinger, Crystal? No, it's not a zinger. It's just a question. Um, the Mueller report is expected to come out sometime. We keep getting reports. It's coming next week. It's coming yeah. too. We don't know. Anyway, it's coming sometime. Um, let's say that he says that we see the report, and he says basically... No conspiracy between President Trump and the Russians, Manafort and Stone, they were doing whatever they were doing, but the president really wasn't involved. Would you still think that he should be impeached? So can I unpack that question a little? Of course. If you don't mind, Krista? Yes. So first of all, you're assuming we see the report, mm -hmm. which is by no means clear. Correct. Second of all, 
you're assuming that the report is the only evidence on the public record that is verifiable and credible. And third of all, you're assuming that the only charge which would justify impeaching this president is collusion between him personally and the Russians as part of the campaign. Mm -hmm. And that you have to be able to, in fact, on a criminal basis, show that that happened. Okay, so I think every one of those assumptions is actually not true. That in fact, on the public record, we've already got more than enough evidence that there's been obstruction of justice. There's more than enough evidence that he is corrupt and takes payment on a daily basis from foreign countries, which is strictly forbidden by the Constitution. Do, are we supportive of the Mueller report? 100%. I don't believe for a second that's going to be what the Mueller report finds. For a second. But I think that we should view it as supporting evidence done by a fine prosecutor on part of what, we're invest what should be investigated and presented openly to the American people. This is a secret criminal report that you don't know what's in it, I don't know what's in it, and neither do the 320 other million Americans who should have a right to know that in fact their president has already and on the public record committed crimes, been corrupt, and, and orchestrated cover-ups. And so when I hear people say, let's wait for the Mueller report, mm -hmm. that to me has always been an excuse to do nothing and to ignore the, plan the fulsome evidence that's already on the public record that this is the most lawless president in American history. Tom Steyer, thank Crystal, you. Thank Great you chatting with you. Me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. We're going to have more rising after this.